Everyone, welcome back. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me my buddy, Dr. Jay Davidson, who is the founder of drjdavidson.com. Uh, let's hope he's the founder of that, because if somebody else took that domain, that wouldn't be very good for him. And uh, he focuses on functional natural medicine. He's a popular speaker and two-time number one international best-selling author. And he was the host of the Chronic Lyme Disease Summit, the Parasite Summit, the Viral and, and Retroviral Summit, and the Mitochondrial Summit. He's also the co-founder of Microbe Formulas. And in this presentation, he's going to be talking all about how radioactive elements are robbing your energy. And uh, I had a chance to, to look over this presentation beforehand, his slides, uh, before we started recording right now. And I'm super excited about this. This is really novel content that I haven't heard anybody else talking about. So I'm, I'm really excited to introduce everyone to Dr. Jay Davidson. Ari, it's awesome being here. So appreciate all the work you do and just the hours that you labor behind the scenes researching and putting things together that people probably don't understand and don't grasp the amount that you do but uh, so appreciate your work and how much you've touched the functional medicine and natural health and even regular medical uh, community with your info so it's really really a pleasure to be on here thank you brother i really appreciate the kind words and uh and the feeling is very mutual so i'm i'm super excited to get into this this is a, a super cool topic so give me you know, kind of let's take us through this. What is this all about? What are radioactive elements? Yeah, so this is this has been brand new in the last probably year and a half to two years of researching. And, and uh, you said it's novel, haven't heard, you know, many people speak or anybody speak on it. And I haven't either. So this has just been kind of going down the rabbit hole and going on to PubMed and going on the internet and researching and really trying to put the pieces together. But it all stemmed from my wife, uh, which a lot of my journey has with her uh, she gave birth to my daughter when she was 30 years old and basically crashed. Lyme disease flared back up. We had uh, heavy metal toxicity issues, which we knew about years before, but couldn't really figure out how to do it. And pretty much everything boiled to the surface. Her body shut down, stopped breastfeeding uh, a couple months, you know, two month old at home. And my wife, you know, nearly dying. That shifted my path. And ever since then, I feel like she's been that guide that just keeps, you know, like, what, what direction do we need to go? And um, I'm very into, you know, I, I like looking at labs. I like looking at uh, symptomatology, you know, the whole examination type thing. But I also like to kind of get into uh, see if, you know, there's a muscle tester, like what do they find is kind of just a tool in the toolbox. Biofeedback, you know, the technology side, I've been very intrigued. There's been a lot of things I would say is definitely just crap out there. But there was one one machine that I thought was really interesting, the adductor machine in the the founder. What's it called? It's called the Eductor, E-D-U-C-T-O-R. Um, another version, an earlier version, it's called the Scio, S-C-I-O. And I had a friend, um, basically my daughter was getting headaches and, and tummy aches when we lived in San Diego at the time and doing all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, you know what, let me just call my friend Trina, you know, she's kind of out in the, you know, energetic world. Let's see what, what she picks up. And she ran a scan uh, on her, on her and picked up basically cranial sacral. Like she really needs some cranial sacral appointments. And I was like, okay, you know, my wife and I were trained chiros, we adjust, but we never went through the cranial sacral type training. So, you know, as far as shifting sutures around and all that, just not super familiar with it and started thinking about it. It's like, you know, this symptom of headaches and stomach pains, uh, tummy aches all started after we moved to San Diego. We just got a couch she started jumping on it. She was only four years old at the time and flipped over the edge, head like face down into the floor, you know, the wood floor or whatever. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you okay? You know, like literally it's like your heart stops as a parent. And then within the same week, she did it for a second time. And it was like, oh my gosh, we, like no more jumping on the couch. You know, this is crazy. And it all kind of stemmed back of like, I think that's actually what triggered it. Went through some cranial sacral, headaches, stomach aches, went away. And I'm like, wow. You know, I guess maybe there is something to this energetic, you know, kind of weird machine stuff. So looked into it and uh, the, the most advanced or the newest machine is the eductor and uh, whatnot. But anyway, so scanning, scanning my wife on that machine, you know, just kind of being more open to it after that experience, radiation and fungus would come up in the top three to top five every scan. And it was like radiation, like we have no Bluetooth in the house. We have no Wi-Fi. Like 
everything's hardwired, you know, obviously there's, you know, lights and things. I mean, you can't be zero, but I feel like really minimized. We don't live next to a cell phone tower. And I, I want to mention something real quick. You know, I in general have been very, very skeptical of a lot of the, the bioenergetic sort of scanning machines. And one of the big reasons why is that they're totally non-repeatable. They just, they seem to actually just be generating random data from what I can tell, because I've tested it and I've done a test where I've, I've scanned myself uh, on several machines, seen what it generates, and then done it again 10 minutes later, generates totally different data. Done it again the next day, totally different data. And so, you know, and, and then I've even talked to the, the owners of some of the, the makers of this, and they're like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the scan itself disrupts your bioenergetic field, and therefore, you know, it will change. I'm like, that is total nonsense to make that claim. Like the, yeah. base, the most basic test of science is that the results have to be repeatable for it to have any validity. If, if it doesn't have that, then it's just random, useless junk data. Yeah, I would, I would concur. I mean, I've been, I've been so interested in technology over the years, the, you know, the Zyto, the Asyro, which is now the Quest 4, and all these different, you know, types of machines, because it's like, oh, this is so cool, but yet the reproducibility was always that thing. And they'd always say, well, it's because you're inputting energy. So, and I'm like, eh, you know, so I've never... Uh, yeah, I've always been open to learning about it, but same thing with you. And basically what, what we found with this biofeedback machine and the, the owner, if you will, is he was part of like the junior NASA program and was like calculating one of the Apollos coming in for a landing in the ocean when they had all these, you know, giant wall computers. And he was like the young kid that figured out exactly where it was before anybody else did, you know, just one of those just apparently uh, off the wall, brilliant, but maybe so brilliant that... Miss, missing something. I don't know. But anyways, coming back to the machine, like radiation kept showing up. And I was thinking just, okay, EMFs, that's all I hear about EMR, electromagnetic radiation. And then um, we came out with a, newer, uh, a new supplement, a mito, mito product, basically mitochondria. And all of a sudden, the muscle testing from some different practitioners started picking up radiation. And I'm like, now it's actually matching up with biofeedback. What happened there? And started going down the route and asking questions and looking at it. And Todd Watts, you know, my good friend, He's like, it's radium, like radium keeps showing up. It's like, what's this? It's like, I don't know. So we started doing research and basically found that uh, there's this thing called a radium belt that's in Wisconsin that basically stretches from Green Bay down to Milwaukee, almost into Illinois. My wife grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. She lived in Illinois for a little bit. Illinois has got really high radium, just like Wisconsin does. And, and it's like, huh, this, and, and I just basically went headfirst into this topic and coming out big picture was this was what I believe the next step is as far as getting people well. And it directly relates, which is really awesome. It directly relates back to the mitochondria. You know, it seems like everything comes back to the mitochondria, the whole cell danger response, which obviously you've researched and talked about a ton, um, you know, mitochondria, and it's basically the dictator of hormones in your body too. I mean, it's like the rate limiting step for hormone production in your body amongst like all kinds of other things. And it's key role in the immune system. And I thought, well, how odd is this that there's such a prevalent area of Lyme disease in Wisconsin, the same area or very, you know, similar area where there's really high radium that suppresses the immune system. It's like, this seems to me in my head to make sense of suppress the immune system. You're more likely to get, you know, infection or, or infections. But really when you dive into the research, radioactive elements, essentially you can say radiation, but I kind of steer away because I think people start thinking about the EMF thing. Mm -hmm. You could say, uh, radioactive metals, but they're not all technically metals. So I kind of go with the, you know, radioactive element term, if you will. And this would be the cesium, uranium, thorium, radium, which I mentioned before. And I think that's really the, the key one to highlight, which there isn't any public testing really available for radium, which I find interesting, but the government tests, it's like, huh, what's, what's going on with that? Um, and then you've got uh, radon, if I didn't say that. And, you know, there's all kinds of these radioactive elements anyways. And so radon when I started going in the, in the mountains, right? Um, it depends on the area. So like radon in Minnesota is in certain pockets is really prevalent where then you basically do the radon detection test, which is air. And then if you have it, they put this, you know, fan in your basement that basically helps us, you know, pull the air out and you're good to go. But the thing is, is um, radium breaks down into radon eventually. And the half-life, depending on the, the isotope, radium, there's 224, 226, and 228. The main ones to be concerned about is 226 and 228. But the 226 has a half-life of 1,600 years. 
So it's like, if that gets in your body, Mm -hmm. that's continually emitting energy that's damaging your DNA and damaging your mitochondria and whatever area it's in is going to basically create inflammation and suppress the immune system. But eventually, radium breaks down into radon. So if you're in an area where there's high radon, then we want to consider, oh, there's probably a lot of radium as well too. So I started going down this route and just kind of high level synopsis, radioactive elements, they suppress your immune system, they cause inflammation, uh, suppress healing. And I've seen just clients over the years, I don't, I don't work with clients currently anymore, but over the years, I, I had so many people where it was like, doc, I just don't feel like my body actually works. Like it's not even healing. And, and I'm trained Cairo, uh, like I, I think your brother was too, or is. And the whole premise when you go to school, it's like your body has this innate ability to heal itself. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, why can some people seem to like do great? And then others, you know, not so much. Uh, and I believe radioactive elements are a piece to the puzzle. Uh, it slows down drainage. Uh, cause, it's a big cause of candida. I used to always think heavy metals and mercury and all this for candida, but I'm really pushing more into the radioactive elements. Uh, and then it damages mitochondria and actually changes your genetic expression. So those are some big things, just high level on uh, the radioactive elements. But as I went through, you know, researching, I'm like, well, maybe it's the you know nuclear incidents, the Three Mile Island, the Chernobyl, the uh, Fukushima that we had in 2011, you know, in Japan, and started looking at, you know, measuring the air, if you will, uh, supply of, you know, where I used to live in Milwaukee area, then used to live in San Diego, you know, more where you're at right now. And then now, you know, I'm in Puerto Rico, and they have a measurement for San Juan. I was like, okay, well, you can see the air amounts of radiation in the air are different. But it's like, is that really, really the factor? And I kept coming back to I don't know, it seems very pocketed and not so much, like I, obviously nuclear incidents and causing radiation across the globe is not good, but it seemed like there was something else. And I think what I figured out was it's more of our water supply. It's that these elements are naturally occurring in the earth. And when we start doing some drilling, fracking or just regular wells, we basically bring out this stuff that's radioactive deep within the crust, or we do a deep well with just well water, if you will. And that, that water is going to contain more of these radioactive elements. So the more that we kind of dig deep in the earth, the more this stuff comes out. Because when they do fracking and they do regular wells, there's this thing called brine that comes out, which is basically unusable. And essentially what they do is they put it into storage, they put it in trucks, they haul it around, it's super radioactive, lots of radium in it. And then they go to either store it or they just shoot it back into the earth and, you know, try to, the other stuff, you know, they're keeping, you know, the whatever, gas and stuff, oil that they're pulling out from it. And it's like, wow, I think that's a factor too. So I really believe as I look at it now, the water supply is probably the big factor for radioactive elements. You know, as, as, as you're talking, the, the, I realized the one other time that I've had any talk of this conversation is a conversation with a uh, guy who, who's the founder of Pure Effects Water Filtration Technology who uh, I've interviewed on my, my podcast, and he brought up this topic of, of radioactive elements in the water supply. You know, for example, in the, 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 Col- the Colorado River that feeds in the ground, the, the, uh, the water for Southern California where I live. And, um, and I had never heard of that. And I remember actually looking into it, this is probably two or three years ago when I did this interview. I remember looking into it and going, oh, sure enough, he's right. There is actually research talking about radioactive elements in the water supply. And, uh, and he specifically created filters around, you know, that, that filter out radioactive elements. So connecting the dots here in my mind as you're talking. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's all I've been doing the last, you know, year and a half, two years and only seeing things make more sense. Uh, so I, I don't think it's the end all, but I do believe that this is, I actually believe radioactive elements are more toxic than heavy metals and heavy metals gets a lot, obviously a ton of attention. Uh, I'm not a fan of glyphosate either, but what's interesting, even research has shown that when plants get sprayed with glyphosate, it actually increases the amount of radioactive elements that are in the plants by up to 17 times. So it's like, wow, we're just throwing another, you know, interesting thing on it. But backing up, you've got different forms of radiation. You've got the gamma radiation, which is, you know, medical testing and, you know, all that stuff, if you will. And that penetrates several layers of tissue, the x-ray, the CT scans, that kind of stuff. But I really want to focus on, as you look, there's three, there's basically three different types. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma is the real intense. Beta 
uh, will penetrate your skin layer, at least the top layer. So if you're taking a shower and there's some beta emitting radioactive elements in the water, you're going to technically be able to absorb them through the skin. Now, what I believe is a big factor, though, is more the alpha. So the beta comes from more the man-made radioactive elements. So that's going to be the Fukushima's, if you will, where they have 1.2, you know, million tons of water right now with over 60 plus different radioactive elements that they're like, we're not really sure what to do with it. We're running out of tanks. And the best option right now that they're getting approved for is to put it back into the ocean. I'm like, man, this is just so crazy what's going on right now. But in there, you've got things like iodine 131. So you hear iodine, you're like, oh, you need it for thyroid and breast tissue and skin. But there's radioactive isotopes of that that are man-made from these nuclear reactors. There's cesium. Uh, that comes from it as well too. So these are the betas. But when you look at the alphas, the alphas are, they don't penetrate your skin. So if you were to take a shower and there's some uranium, there's some radium, if you will, radon, even though radon's a gas, it actually will get into the water supply too. So there's actually a small amount that gets in the water supply. So if you're taking a shower and you're like, well, even with these radioactive elements that are in the water, these alpha emitting radioactive elements, they actually don't penetrate the top layer of skin. But the thing is, is they can also be, if you ingest it, so any water you drink, and that's why it's so important to have some type of filtration when you're drinking water, but they can also be inhaled. And I'm thinking, how many people take hot showers and are these you know, chemicals vaporizing and also breathing in? And we assume that they're alpha emitting, that they don't penetrate the top layer of skin, but you hear people quote all the time, well, if you're getting, if chlorine in the water, you're going to be absorbing that and it's you know, for every 10 minutes in a shower, and you know, you have no idea where they get these stats, but every 10 minutes, you know, you're, it's one glass of water worth of chlorine because you're absorbing it. It's like, okay. So what, what I like to think about, Ari, is keying in on it, I, I really believe it's radium because you can run um, like heavy metal testing through uh, doctor's data, for instance, the urine, urine toxic metals been popularized over, you know, years in the functional medicine side, and it's got heavy metals that it tests for, what comes out in your urine. But also in there is uranium and cesium, but there's no radium. And the government's done radium testing. The Environmental Working Group has done testing. The Environmental Working Group tested over 157 different public utilities, and they basically found that over half of America has radium that exceeds the level of basically putting you at risk of cancer. Wow. And uh, I mean... So they said 170 million Americans, they did this study, I believe from 2010 to 2015, you know, surveying and testing all the water. So it's about five years old, obviously, when they released it. But um, they said that 80% of Texas has radium uh, that's in a basically exceeding government levels in a toxic amount. You know, 80% of the state of Texas, 170 million Americans total, which is basically like 50%. And I'm like, great, so where can we test this stuff? It's like, I don't know. And then when I looked in the research, really diving in radium, some of it comes out in your kidneys, but it's easiest processed by your body to excrete it through your stools. I think it's gentler on your system. And according to this textbook where they actually had this only place I saw it, 98% of all radium that came out of the body left through the feces. Mm. So I'm like, okay, so maybe we have to go and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I really believe that we need to get better testing to really fully understand this. Cause a lot of this, I'm just theorizing and I'm pulling out of research and it clearly makes sense. But again, this is very, you know, very early on, but going back to the alpha emitting radiation, if you're standing by a campfire, great. You know, you're a, a few feet away, depending on how big it is, it's going to feel good. But now imagine taking that ash and swallowing it. And as soon as you swallow that ash, now there's a whole level of damage that happens versus just like, oh, I'm feeling the heat. And I know it's an extreme example, but it's kind of to show that the alpha emitting radiation, which when we're looking again at the alpha emitting radiation, we're looking at um, you know radium, radon, uranium, thorium as well, plutonium, um, pol uh, polonium. Uh, so there's a bunch of different isotopes. But when you actually ingest it, drink it in the water, or actually breathe it in, that's when it's getting into your system and it's your body has a really hard time clearing it out. And that's when it's going to be continually emitting this uh, energy that's breaking bonds. So that's what it means by ionizing radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, is that it's strong enough to basically damage your bonds. The, the radiation that a lot of 
people in the health space right now are talking about is non-ionizing radiation, the cell phone towers, the, you know, and there's a lot of like, seems like there's a, a good amount of research, but it still seems like enough to, to kind of question like what's its effect and, you know, all this. But I, I think the radioactive elements is more of a slam dunk. Like this is bad. This is damaging mitochondria. This is suppressing the immune system, which of course, if it damages mitochondria is going to have that effect on the cell danger response. But mm -hmm. yeah. So where, where do we go from here? Understanding that these things are likely there we're, we're are, is it fair to say that we're all being exposed to this to some degree or is it just specifically in certain geographical areas uh, um it's a great question so i mean based on the fact that they found you know half of america like 27 states where it exceeds limits it was all over and you can look at the map environmental working group has an interactive map and you can see and click on it and i went there I clicked on it and I started researching the radium belt and you can see where basically radium is really high in this whole, they call it like the belt from Green Bay to Milwaukee, like I mentioned. And I clicked on where we used to live. We used to live in, we used to live in Waukesha, kind of looks like Waukesha, Wisconsin. It's like a suburb of Milwaukee. And I clicked Smack on it. in the center of the, the, the radium belt. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And it was 10 point, I think five or 10 point eight. Uh, Pico Curies per liter. And essentially the government set a limit of five is kind of, you know, yeah, you know, anything under five is fine. And that was, you know, more than double, 10 plus. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I think back when my wife crashed from giving birth to my daughter and Lyme disease flared up, that's exactly where we lived at. I'm like, that's got to be a piece to this whole puzzle. Uh, so I, I, I still believe, you know, mold plays a role, other toxins like heavy metals and glyphosate, emotional stress, I mean, um, parasitic infections and other types of chronic infections, bacteria and virus. But I don't know, I just keep coming back to this seems like it is a big one. It's, I don't know of any testing, which we're right now in our lab, we're actually, uh, we've invested quite a bit in equipment. We want to try to figure out if we can test this, actually have people send it in because I don't know anybody else that you know, has it available. If somebody knows, just love to hear that. Yeah. But, it, but I'm, essentially, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the map right here. And I mean, almost the whole East Coast, especially Florida and the Northeast, as well as a lot of the Midwestern states and Southern states, Texas. Um, and then, unfortunately, Southern California and, you know, San Diego. LA, San Francisco, Seattle, you know, those particular areas look like they've gotten pretty hit pretty hard. Salt Lake City, Phoenix. But yeah, it's it's interesting to look at at this map. And for people watching the video, the you know, we're hopefully displaying the the slide here and people can see this. But yeah, it seems to be all over. I would say, you know, the Dakotas, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho basically where people don't it. live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those areas look like they've got it the least. But you also wonder, did they do a lot of testing too? Did they really right. focus more with the more populated areas? Right. So yeah. the thing to key in on, I, I don't want, I don't want people to be in fear. This is just, again, becoming aware. And as we become aware, then there becomes more options, right? Like you look at what's available for food today versus 15 years ago. I mean, there's so many more natural option you know, more things are transparent because we've become aware. So that's what really I want to come from this. But radium is probably that one thing that I would key in on. Uranium, uh, we think about it because it's used to power nuclear reactors. But radium has 3 million times more energy than uranium. So radium is a big thing. And again, when you have something that's got a half-life of 1600 years and it gets inside your body, I'm sorry, like... <laughs> You know, it's it, it, and half life just means that if you have a, a milliliter or a milligram, if you will, of some toxin like radium, that it's going to take 1600 years for the isotope 226 to basically break down, emit energy, and get rid of, in your body to excrete half of that, you know, one milligram or one liter, you know, depending on what type of uh, it is. So, thinking about that, it's like, okay, this stuff's around for a while. And the thing about radium is you can't smell it, you can't taste it in the water. Um, and it is a bone seeker. It it loves to compete for calcium and go into the bone. And when it goes in the bone, it's starting to mess up immune system, bone marrow, all that 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 stuff. And lead has been uh, really, you know, viewed as well. It's that's the osteoporosis 
thing, right? Lead competes for calcium, but radium does too. And radium actually is more damaging than lead. So I'm not, I don't want to discount lead, but really I want to give more attention to, um, to radium just with all the testing that that's really occurred. So, yeah. Um, I, I want to mention something and then ask a question, um, for people listening, you, you know, you, Jay's mentioned a couple of times lead in the water. People would, I think, be shocked to learn that uh, there are actually recognized unsafe levels of lead, which is, we have way more science on that. It's been way, around way longer than radioactive elements. We know this is extremely toxic. For example, affects uh, development of fetuses uh, in, the, in the womb and um, numerous health problems are associated with lead poisoning and, or just, just chronic intake of small amounts of lead. That, that's at unsafe levels. And yet a, a large portion of population populated areas have unsafe levels of lead in the water. Plus, aside from what's standardized, you know, and sort of the uh, city filtration areas, there's also an issue of uh, lead piping, old lead plumbing in people's homes that's leaching lead into the water from the time it goes from the city, you know, filtration areas uh, and sanitation areas to to people's homes, it's 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 actually acquiring more lead, and so I think people, many people think, ah, you know, the city's taking care of it, they're monitoring it, they've got all the, you know, they know what's safe and unsafe, they're sanitizing the water of all these unsafe chemicals, and I think people would be shocked to learn that there's already an, an issue of unsafe amounts of many known harmful substances, and I think radioactive elements are just adding to that list. Yeah, bingo. I mean, look look at this summit, right? It's a superhuman energy summit. Why am I talking about radioactive elements? Because it's damaging the mitochondria, the energy, you know, the cell energy generators that we were taught in biology. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, I can't get up over this hump. I just can't get any sustained energy. Well, what if the water you're drinking every single day is actually contributing to that? You know, unless you're Dr. Boris Laszlo and don't really drink water, you know, and just <laughs> use, you know, then then you don't have that issue. But most people, right? I I I I'm like, that's really interesting. You really don't drink water. But, you know, for the vast majority of people, we're, you know, what we understand is you should drink water because uh, our body is mostly made out of it. But if the water you're drinking has these chemicals in it, it's like, you know, clearly we need to, we need to shut the source off. And I go back and forth, you know, talk, talking with scientists and it's like people that are actually trained, they're not just listening to uh, summits and stuff and like what the hot topics are. And, and I'm like, what is the best water? Because I really believe that there's the, there's the chemistry of water, which is the whole filtration side, but there definitely seems like there's also the physics of water, you know, the whole fourth phase of water and, you know, all this work that's been done on, um, if you will, structure of water. I'm like, okay, I think they're both relevant, but as far as the chemistry of water, what is the best filtration? Because I used to own ionizers and, you know, you hear about, well, don't drink RO water or distilled because it's basically like dead water and you want high pH and all this. And, Right now, where I'm at right now, I really believe that we've been, we've had the rug pulled out from under us on this whole pH thing that, uh, you know, I think back over the years when I used to have, a, uh, when we have our chiropractic office in Wisconsin, and I remember this guy coming in to do live blood cell analysis. I'm like, this is really cool. And I'm like, well, what do you, you know, what do you recommend? He's like, oh, I just recommend that you follow, you know, plant diet because it's just high alkaline foods. I'm like, Okay. Uh, what else? He's like, Oh no, that's all you do. You just, just eat high alkaline. And I'm like, you don't even look healthy though. Like I, I don't really want to you know, follow what, what you're doing. And, but yet you see so much of like, Oh, you need 7.365 is really where your blood pH should be. But when you look at the chemistry of pH, it's a man-made scale zero to 14, you know, man just created, if you will, it stands for potential hydrogen, but it's measured in millivolts the lower the pH, meaning like one pH, which we would say is super acidic, you know, that's like the sulfuric acid and all that, that's actually got the most energy. But the higher the pH, the less energy. And I'm like, I almost feel like we're going the wrong direction. And in the water side, you know, how do you get a high pH? You just add some minerals to the water. It's like, okay, well, it, are we even supposed to have minerals in the water? So I've been really processing this whole water thing. Right now, uh, I've got a Berkey at home, but I'm still, I'm, I'm flustered at that company too. Cause I've, I've learned like they just private label stuff. They actually don't create it. But the research that they did for the Berkey 
they looked at radioactive elements and I was like, great, you know, they're filtering 99% or whatever, but it was the first 50 gallons. I'm like, well, what happens after right. gallon 100, gallon 1,000? I'm like, man, we... <laughs> And, 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 as, and, as, and for people listening, in case that not easy to follow, it's what happens after the filters get saturated and they start to lose their efficacy in filtering out those elements that they, at the beginning, filter out 99 or 99.9% of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just, I'm so, there's just so much to this topic. It's like what, and I don't have clear answers as much as I really believe radioactive elements are a big piece. I would say number one step is filter your water. Mm-hmm. distilled water, RO water. You know, I have a Berkey right now. I'm still on the fence of what the best thing is. And it seems like every practitioner I talk to, they have some different water filter that they like. I'm like, I, I, I'm just up in the air. So I don't know if you have a favorite on that or looked into it. I, I get Palomar spring water delivered, which is I've seen their third party data on, you know, contaminants and it's extremely pure. And, um, I, and I get that spring water delivered. I have a 60 gallon drum in my garage. They charge me a, a dollar per gallon. Wow. And I get that thing filled up probably every three weeks. And, um, yeah, so we have, you know, very pure high altitude spring water delivered to my house. I I've also like you gone through many different varieties of filters and I have, you know, I've gone through RO, I've gone through the gravity filters, the Berkey's and the Aquaceras and things like that. And then, um, the, uh, the pure effects are probably my favorite of, are, they are my favorite of the filter options, uh, which is not RO. It's, it's called a multimedia filter. It just runs it through just different chambers of things, but it's not technically in a reverse osmosis process. So it doesn't strip it of, of minerals, but yeah, I mean, there's still, as you said, this issue of, you know, okay, we know how those filters work at the beginning, but what is it, how well do they work six months into it, you know? Yeah. And, and we don't really have great data on that. And I certainly hope that they, they still work pretty well, but we don't really know. Yeah, because I remember buying, when I bought the Berkey, they're like, oh yeah, the black filters on the top, they last five to seven years. It's like, well, yeah what are they testing for five or seven years? And, and maybe they do, you know, I, I don't want to be throwing arrows or anything, but I, it's more of like, well, let's test to a hundred gallons of radioactive elements. Let's test to a thousand gallons. Like where does it drop off and where does it drop off at? Right? Like, I, yeah, it'd just be great to have some data. So I think really a big takeaway from all this and the whole topic of radioactive elements is understand radioactive elements. I think you're going to be hearing more and more of it. Obviously I'm, you know, really in the forefront of trying to, educate and challenge the status quo, if you will, see if we can get some testing and things, but um, filter your water. I think that's a big thing, you know, limit or either get stuff like you get that, you know, Hey, there's no radium. There's no, you know, uranium, cesium, iodine, right? The deeper in the earth you go, the more that you're going to get these radioactive elements. But then you also have to be aware there are the, the beta emitters that are from man-made, you know, when Fukushima happened, they found iodine-131 over in Vermont coming out of the milk of the cows. It's like, okay, well, you know, that that's going to happen in those type of events. But generally speaking, the deeper into the earth you go, uh, the more you're going to pick up these radioactive elements. So it is, yeah, it's, it sounds good for, I, I, for what I have, you got. I have one question before you get to the other practical strategies. Um, you mentioned that at least some of the radon was it radon? Not radon. Uh, radium gets uh, excreted through the feces. I'm curious if you found any data on, you know, what percentage of the radium that's ingested actually gets absorbed into the body versus gets excreted. And like, does it, I mean, is it possible that it just sort of mostly passes through or does it seem to all get absorbed and then pass through the body for a while and then only a small percentage gets excreted? Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, on, the, only, the only place that I found, it was a textbook of research and I could find the, the reference for it, but it was basically that when they gave radium and what came out, 2% came out through the kidneys and the rest through the feces or 98% but it didn't actually specify how much was staying in the body versus, right. you know, so their, their percent could have been a hundred percent of it could have been flushed out, which I, I have a hard time believing that, but I mean, that's always possible. Some, if some pass through the kidneys at all, then, then that suggests that at least some of it is getting absorbed into the body. 
Yeah. I, I, I mean, when I look at it to see like, and I get, and I understand if people don't, you know, aren't open to muscle testing or biofeedback. Like, I don't think anything's an end all. I just always look at it as they're all tools, you know, it's kind of just inputting data and does it make sense? And as I inputted that data, it all lined up and, and made so much sense. I mean, I look at, oh man, there's just, there's so much, there's just so much to it. So um, in, in the end, yeah, filtering your water is super important. I'm a big fan of iodine. Um, and in the, and in the, you know, um, iodine to iodide, the salt form of iodine ratio, the Lugol's ratio. Um, we've got one with some recommend Lugol's. I don't because the liquid, uh, we, I mean, we have our own, so clearly I'm going to be biased toward that, but the, the Lugol's, if you ingest a liquid, it basically gets stored, uh, tore up by the stomach acid. So if you're going to do something like that, then you're just going to probably just put it topically, you know, on and absorb, absorb through the skin. Uh, we've got one that we are able to get compressed into a, a tablet. So it doesn't get basically ripped up, ripped apart by the stomach acid. It's 12 and a half milligrams of the iodide iodine ratio with some bioactive carbons uh, that are more for binding on to halogens. Cause the issue that I have seen uh, is that you've got bromine chlorine, fluoride, these other chemicals and, and fluorine, you know, fluoride and chlorine are in the water supply. Bromine, you buy a brand new electronic and it's got brominated flame retardants on it or the, you know, furniture, if you will. So we're exposed to all these different halogens and in our food supply, it's all this stuff too, brominated vegetable oil and, you know, even finding Gatorade and obviously it's not good to drink anyways. But anyways, we're surrounded by these other halogens that essentially compete for iodine, kick it off uh, and then they're there. So when people take iodine and they react, I, I really believe some of it's because there's no open receptors that these other halogens are occupying the receptors of where iodine should be. So the bioactive carbons we add in extracts of fulvic acid uh, are for specifically helping to bind onto the halogens to then kind of empty that out. So mm-hmm. a lot of the quote unquote Hashimoto thyroid storms and things we just don't see, you know, adding that element. So yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, you know, one of my good friends, Dr. Alan Christensen, actually his next book is very centered around iodine and thyroid health. And, um, one of the things, I mean, I'll, I'll communicate his perspective. I definitely don't claim to be an expert on this particular topic, but basically his perspective is there is a very, very narrow range of optimal for iodine intake, much narrower than, than most other substances. And uh, yes, it's possible to be deficient, but it's also possible to have too much of it. And, and, and that, that definitely contributes uh, to increased risk of Hashimoto's. So you, you alluded to it there, but just to kind of frame that, um, what, what do you think of that and, and how would you respond? Uh, it's interesting. You know, I'd love to read his, you know, book or information that he puts out when it's out there. I, you know, life's been a lot different in the last three or four years since I've been hanging around some scientists that have really had different perspectives than what's been out there in the mainstream media. For instance, like minerals, there's plant derived minerals or organic minerals, which essentially are bound to a carbon molecule, or there's inorganic minerals. And in the mineral topic, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm copper toxic. It's like, well, as I look at it, I really believe that somebody could be copper toxic and copper deficient at the same time, meaning that there's different valences of these copper minerals, if you will, and certain ones are not beneficial for the body. For instance, you mentioned lead pipes. Well, houses have copper pipes. So is that copper in a pipe actually the copper that the body needs, or are we actually needing more of an organic copper that's a plant derived, right? That's been basically brought up through the earth, processed by the plant, and now it's more, you know, utilized by the body. And and, and obviously you can take other minerals as an instance. And and I I honestly think that in a copper toxicity type state, this is just my personal feeling, is that a lot of those people, they're they're toxic of the inorganic form, but they're actually deficient of the inorganic or uh, they're they're deficient of the plant derived form because we fear we find out, Oh, according to this test, I'm toxic. So I'm going to completely stay away from it. But what if the answer is actually consuming plant derived minerals, which I don't believe you can actually become toxic of those because their body can process them. So if there's excess, like, or if there's too much, like the body just clears them out. Um, but you can become toxic of inorganic minerals where they build up 
in the body. And I, I actually believe the plant derived can help to, I don't want to use the word chelate, but can help actually remove the inorganic to help swap out and replace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I wonder that with iodine as well in the form, because there's, there's, you know, been iodine experts over the years, like uh, Dr. Brownstein, which is, you know, he, he'll, he'll get to a lot higher dosing than other people like, um, you know, Isabella Wentz, I think is a lot lower, lot lower dosing iodine type and, you know, have all these people in between, but he says, well, you can, or you can never become toxic if, if I remember reading his, his stuff uh, properly, you know, from years ago, you can never really become toxic of it because your body just cleared out. It's like, okay, well that definitely is different than Dr. Alan Christensen, but then this is also brand new too. So it'd, it'd be interesting to, to really look at that. Yeah. My, my intuitive feeling on it is to consume iodine like in the form of foods in the form of seaweed for example rather than like if you were going to supplement with it rather than to to use something like lugols but uh, what's which seems to be aligned with what you're saying but i'm curious do you have any specific thoughts on how you're recommending people to consume iodine yeah well again i i don't believe we get enough in our diet unless somebody's like a big sushi nori seaweed person and i don't know actually many people that are <laughs> uh that eat you know eat a lot of that food so i'm i'm a big component of supplementing iodine obviously i'm i'm going to be biased toward ours but ours is a, a plant derived iodine iodide uh with the uh bioactive carbons in there to help with the halogen and i look at iodine though as a long term thing so if if somebody believes hey we're deficient because it's not in the soil and you know, my body needs it. Like every cell of the body needs iodine. So if somebody says, well, I'm allergic to iodine, it's like you can't be because otherwise you wouldn't be alive. Like your body needs it. Every cell does. Mm -hmm. It's known for the thyroid. It's known for breast tissue. It's known for skin, but it's really needed, you know, throughout, throughout the body. But I look at iodine, it's a long-term thing. Like, you know, you don't have to mega dose for a week and think that you're going to catch up. Like it's just get it in, you know, lower amounts is good. Just continually get it. And that's more of a long-term nutrient. I'm not a big fan of a lot of supplements forever because then I feel like you're just not getting to the source. You're just, you know, kind of doing the pharmaceutical thing, but with supplements. Mm -hmm. uh, but iodine w would be one of those more nutrients where I'm like, long term, I think that is an important thing. Got it. So filter the water, take iodine, yep. or consume foods rich in iodine. What do you have any other thoughts on practical strategies to combat radioactive elements? Yeah, I, I would say detox at the mitochondrial level and. Um, this all started from uh, the, the Mito product that we came out with that all of a sudden it stirred, I, what I believe is it stirred these radioactive elements out of the mitochondria and now all of a sudden we had people start muscle testing and had it come up as a priority when it never did before. I think it brought a whole new thing that confirmed then the biofeedback, right? You're kind of getting multiple things. So really looking at the mitochondria level and it, there's a lot of talk about, well, heal at the cellular level and detox at the cellular level, but the mitochondria are inside of the cell. And red blood cells don't have mitochondria, but you know, on average, anywhere between, generally speaking, hundreds to maybe 10,000 uh, mitochondria per cell. But there's actually parts of the brain, Ari, uh, uh, areas in the sub substantia Niagara, this was published in Neuron in 2017, I believe, 2 million mitochondria per cell. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow. So we have, we have up to 2 million mitochondria per cell in some of the brain tissue, um, you know, regular brain tissue, more like 10,000 that we need to really key in on these mitochondria. It's, so it's interesting to think of that statistic in light of Parkinson's disease, which uh, specifically affects the, the substantia nigra of the brain. And if that's the, you know, we would expect since mitochondria are kind of these environmental sensors that are very, that are picking up on uh, and are sensitive to stresses and and threats and and toxins in in the body. We would logically kind of expect the areas that are densest in mitochondria to maybe be affected first or affected the most. And I, I'm, I'm sure you know this, but there's there's quite a lot of research on mitochondrial dysfunction being linked with Parkinson's disease. Yes, yeah, yeah. I I I just really believe that as we look at natural health or the way the body's supposed to function, everything should come back to the mitochondria, mm -hmm. but then it's, so everything to support it. So detoxing chemicals out at the mitochondria level, boom, that makes a ton of sense. Now the question is, well, what is that? Because I mean, you have uh, some of the world that doesn't even believe detox is necessary because you were born with a liver and two kidneys, which I kind of <laughs> think is 
silly. And then you have, you know, other people it's amazing that, it's like, that, that, that that masquerades as the scientific position, you know, but uh, yeah. I, I, so it, it is what it is. It's like, well, there's 85,000 chemicals registered in the United States. Yeah. Uh, but you've probably, got a liver and kidneys. So it doesn't matter yeah. how many thousands of more chemicals your body is bombarded with. There's no need for anything that supports detoxification processes. We should just keep adding more thousands of chemicals and expect our liver and kidneys to, to do what they do. Yeah, yeah. And all supplements that claim detox is a scam, right? So right. I, I, don't, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's not great, but I mean, yeah. clearly this has helped, you know, there's this whole industry has helped a ton of people, but look at glyphosate. Glyphosate, as soon as you consume it, it shuts down bile secretion. It shuts down the whole P450 enzyme, you know, in phase one, it also shuts down actually bile secretion and bile excretion of the liver, which is what processes the chemicals, dumps it in the liver, clears it out. It's like, okay, so one toxin actually slows or shuts that process down. Mm -hmm. What are these other things, you know, what are these other things doing? So I'm a big fan of, yeah, detoxing at the mitochondrial level, really looking at that. And we're looking at a bunch of stuff in the lab and how to help accelerate that. The one thing that triggered this whole thing was the, was the mito, mito product, the mito restore. Uh, that we've got, but my which is which is mostly fulvic acid, right? Or or molecules derived from fulvic acid. Yeah, yeah, they're basically yeah extracts of uh, fulvic acid, and then our scientists, if you will, will add and change you know things to it, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but very low pH, which is very different too. Like the we have this product called biomolecular oxygen, which has a, a pH about one and a half. And most people will be like, oh my gosh. But actually, when you think about it, if you consume something with a high pH and it gets into the, and it's into the stomach, like your stomach is really low pH and it should be. So there's going to be, you know, some competition, uh, some competition with it. But the pH thing is probably, we can probably put that on the side for another discussion or I can, you know, put you in contact with some, uh, you know, like Jeff or whatever on our team scientists that can talk more about it if you ever want to. But mm -hmm. the last, last recommendation I would say is Tudka. T-U-D-C-A. So it's an acronym, uh, all in capitalized letters. Technically, it's supposed to be Tudka. Uh, some people say Tudka. You can go back and forth on how you want to pronounce it. I like to say uh, Tudka, but Tudka stands for Tororso Deoxycholic Acid. And it's something the body naturally makes. It's in about 2% uh, of our bile uh, naturally. If you look at like bear bile or bull bile, that can be 40 to 50% of the concentration uh, with it. So it's Tudka has been used for... Um, you know, supposedly two, 3,000 years in Chinese medicine because they would take like bear bile. So when sometimes people look at Tudka, they're like, I'm not going to take that because it comes from an animal or, you know, it's like endangering bears. I'm sure there's probably stuff that comes still from there, but that's really where it, it comes back in, in history, if you will, to be a long-term thing. But Tudka has been shown to protect the mitochondria. Tudka has been, it's a water-soluble bile acid. So if somebody's missing a gallbladder, just taking a capsule with a meal can just help people digest you know, meals, especially that are fatty. Uh, but in general, it actually helps to increase the bile production, the bile salt concentration. So you actually get better quality and more. It actually helps uh, more bile to come out in the feces because bile gets recycled. It's really expensive energy wise to make. So it keeps getting, you know, circulated basically at the distal part of the small intestine gets absorbed, gets sent back to the Get, get sent back to liver and on it goes, well then, you know, fat soluble toxins can come along with it. So the more you're actually excreting bile, I, I think actually can be very helpful. But uh, yeah, Tudka is really good for mitochondria. It's been actually awesome research for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even Huntington's disease. Uh, there's been research and I can, I can send you this. This was another rabbit hole I went down. I'm like, I cannot believe how much research there's on this. Uh, cardiovascular, diabetes, um, helping thyroid, uh, I'm probably missing stuff. I mean, there's just, there's so much. So I, I, if there's like one product that I love because I'm a really big fan of the liver, really supporting the liver. It's like the detox lifeline of the body, but so much happens too in that liver. Uh, the one product I'd recommend is Tudka or Tudka, you know, T-U-D-C-A. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, my friend, Jay, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the summit and delivering this really novel content. Thank you for putting the pieces together on this topic um, and, and spending so much time digging into this really novel, fascinating stuff and explaining it in, in, such, a, uh, in such a clear way that makes sense. So this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on to the summit. Uh, if somebody's interested in learning more about what you do or getting some of the supplements you mentioned, do you want to mention uh, where they can learn more about that? 
Oh yeah. 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 It's been a pleasure to be on Aria. Like I said, I just appreciate uh, what you're doing and all the time you're putting in. Uh, Cause it, it is, it's like you go down a rabbit hole. You're like, what just happened today? I just read like <laughs> how many articles and, and you know, but it, it's, it's all good. It's, it's, it's for the better of humanity and figuring all this out. But uh, yeah, I've got, my main website is just drjdavidson.com. Uh, we've got a retail line of our supplement products, microbeformulas.com. And then we also have a practitioner line where we do practitioner trainings and things like that. So if you're a practitioner, you can check that out. It's uh, cellcorebiosciences.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much, my friend. Really a, pre- a pleasure chatting with you as always. Thanks. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next